So we've discussed that a register is just one or more bits of memory, one or more flip-flops in this case, that are together, that are used as a unit. If you have an 8-bit machine like a Nintendo Entertainment System back in the 80s, it's an 8-bit machine, 8-bit words. They call them words. That's the unit that is commonly accessed and modified at the same time. Then you have an 8-bit register, a modern desktop or laptop computer would be 64 bits, a 64-bit word, so 64 flip-flops to make a register, or whatever fancy technology they use, but you could do it with 64 flip-flops. So it's just one or more together. Now, there's two different ways you can access a flip-flop, serial or parallel. Parallel means all the bits at the same time, serial means one bit at a time. And then, of course, you can have input and output. So you could have serial in, serial out, parallel in, parallel out, or mix and match. So let's say I have three flip-flops. These are your nice D flip-flops. D1, D2, and D3 are the inputs. Q1, Q2, and Q3 are the outputs. And then they have their write signal. There's no read signal because it's just connect to the output. So glossing over parallel, it's very simple. Parallel input is you have a wire going to each of the inputs. That's it. Parallel output is you have a wire going to each of the outputs. That's it. It's just you're reading and writing all at the same time. There's nothing fancy, and we're done. So anytime you have anything serial, you can just have parallel at the same time. It's just connect a wire. Congratulations, it's parallel. The interesting part is the serial. So obviously one way you could do one bit at a time is to have some sort of multiplexer where you have a bit that's your input or output, and then you have another specifier that says, okay, I want to write into this flip-flop, or this one, or this one. And that would work fine, but it would be a horrendous amount of unnecessary wiring. Instead, we're just going to tie these together. And this entire register ends up having only three wires. Of course, we have a right wire down here, which is all connected over here. So you might say this is D, this is Q, and this is W. But I'm actually going to change it, and I'm going to say R slash W. Now we do have a read signal. What happens here? You can only have one D, but you have to specify to all three. But remember, we're using edge triggering or we're using a master-slave setup so that this output and this input will never change at the same time. Either it takes time to propagate over or you have the interlocking of a master-slave. But let's say D1, or let's say Q1. Let's say Q1 is high, high, and high. So our output right now is high. The output is what is the last bit currently. You can't read any of these others. I mean, if you want parallel, hook up a wire, and now you have parallel out, like I said. But if you're using just serial out, then you can only see the last bit in line, and you can only set the first bit in line. So let's say this is low currently. Read write is not on. Well, if what you want to read is the last bit, then you don't set the signal. It's already telling you what the last bit is, so you could do something with it. Say, okay, the last bit is high. But what happens if we write? If we turn on this signal, we've got a low on this D1, but Q1 is staying high because read write is not on. Let's activate the read write signal. This is staying low, but now D1 is becoming low, but Q1 is not yet because either it's propagating across or the master-slave interlock, you get the point. It is read the D1, and that's in there now. It is read D as D1, and there's a low in there, but Q1 is still stable. While it's pulling in the low, it's still putting out the high until the clock turns back off. So D2 is pulling in from Q1 a high. D3 is pulling in from Q2 a high. And of course, Q3 is still going out to Q. Now, the signal turns off, and all of these propagate over. The changes are finalized, you might say. So now there's a low and a high and a high, and it's not keeping that signal anymore. So what we've done is we've taken one bit and shoved it into the first flip-flop, and all of the rest have moved over by one because each one is connected to the output. Each input is the output of the previous one. So it's like if you had, you know, a whole bunch of people in a line. Somebody reaches out with one hand and grabs something and holds it, but in their other hand is still whatever was there. Let me get in frame here. So 
at, at this moment in time, let's say this. So at this moment in time, you have something in your hand and everybody can see what it is. And this hand isn't doing anything. So the read-write signal turns on and then you come over here and grab something from your neighbor. Now you have what your neighbor was holding, but you're still holding the other thing and people are looking at that and saying, oh, and then you hand that to your neighbor and then you put this in the other hand, see, and you're just handing it off in one direction. So if we did this again, let's go ahead and change D to high but nothing happens because we haven't set this read-write signal. So we set it, the high goes in here, this one, there's a low in its neighbor, this one, there's a high in its neighbor, and then we turn off the signal. So now it updates and we've got high, low, high. And the output is still high, of course, because it's just reading this last one. Let's do it again. So we'll change this back to a low, and then we turn on read-write. D1 becomes low, D2 gets the one before is high, D3 gets the one before is low, and then we turn off the read-write signal, and it propagates over low, high, low. Now Q3 is low, so your output is low. So that's your serial in, your write. You set whatever the datum is that you want to put in, and then you turn on the read-write signal, and D1 takes the D, D2 takes the Q1, and so forth. The first flip-flop takes on the input value, everything else scoots over one, and whatever was in here drops off the end and is gone. You know, if you have a shelf of books and you put a book and push it over and put a book and push it over, all the books are scooting over and eventually the books fall off the other side. So what about the reading? So that's writing, what about reading? Well, that's why it's the same signal, right? Let's say you didn't have inputs. Let's say that you had stored three bits. So at some point in the past, you set a bit, read, write, set a bit, read, write, set a bit, read, write. So you've put three bits in here. The first bit you put in is here, the second is here, the third is here. So first in, first out. In Unix parlance, that would be a pipe. But then let's say that you just put it there for temporary storage. Now you just want to read it back out. So you see what Q is, that's your first bit, then you issue the signal. The third one becomes the second one, the second one becomes the first one, and the first one becomes whatever D is. And if you're only reading and you don't care about what's in here after you're done reading, then don't bother setting D, so this one will now be garbage. So then you see whatever Q is, that's your second bit, you issue the signal again, three becomes two, two becomes the garbage one was, one becomes new garbage. And then you see what Q is, and that's your third bit, and then you can read write again for completeness sake, just to make yourself feel better. And now all three will be garbage. That's what's called a destructive readout. So that's why it's both a read and a write signal. You might call it an advance signal, but I think read write is just more logical. It's read write advance. So when you give the signal, it reads the input, it sets the output, shifts everything over. The one signal does all those things, and it's just what you do with the voltages that matters. So there's multiple reasons to do something like this. Obviously, it takes a lot longer. It takes some processing circuitry and many clock cycles. And you're saying, why don't we just hook up a bunch of wires? Well, eventually you run out of wires. Think about your Arduino or whatever. Your microcontroller has a certain number of pins. When you run out of pins, you're done. So you'll do things like shift registers that allow you to fan out or fan in. Let's say, for example, you have a video game controller. So here is your video game controller. Got your little squiggly wire, and the wire goes into your console, and here you have a shift register. Let's say it's parallel in, serial out. So you've got a bunch of wires connecting to this cable on your gamepad, or you're probably going to have this shift register in the gamepad itself because you're not going to want to run this many wires out the cable. Yeah, let me update it. Let's do this more like you'd actually have. So you have your much bigger game controller now with your cable going to your computer. And inside here is a shift register. On the one end, you have a bunch of wires, a traces on a PCB that connect parallel in. And then you have your write signal. Let's say W for that. So this would be connected to all of the flip-flops internally. So, you know, once every 60th of a second, for example, a signal would come in from the computer to say, okay, I'm starting to read the controller now. So the signal comes in, it triggers on this, and all of the pins lock on whether each button is up or down. And then the signal turns off, and now they're flip-flops, so you can keep pressing buttons, you know, if you're bouncing or whatever, but it's going to have one value or another. So for the next 60th of a second, or when the next pulse comes in, the flip-flops are all going to have the same value. But now let's say you have your serial out, 
and you have a read pin. So the serial out comes down through here, just like the right did. So there's the right, there's the read, and however many pins, you know, two to get a voltage, whatever. But your computer, which is only connected to this controller, let's say by USB or by a custom controller, there's only so many pins you can have on it. And these are connected to a microcontroller in your video game system, for example, and you have only so many pins, so you want to use as few pins as possible. So you have your pins for positive and negative power, and then you have your read and write pins and a data pin. So the data pin would be showing you whatever the result of this last bit is, whatever this last flip-flop in line is. So your game system knows what button that corresponds to, so it makes a note or processes or whatever that value, and then it issues the R signal, the read signal, which is different from the write signal. They're both hooked up together, but one is hooked up to all of them and the other one is, you know, shift over. One is the parallel in, one is the serial out. So the write is connected to all the pins together and makes them all go together. And read is the one that makes them shift to each other's, right? You know, Q3 is connected to D4 and so forth. So your game console will issue the read signal, which will drop this one off the end, it'll read in garbage or whatever, or it wouldn't even have an input, and then the second one is now over here, the third one is now over here, fourth one is now over here, and it just does that one at a time. It takes a while, but it takes much less than a sixtieth of a second. The user is not going to notice because you have processors operating in the kilohertz, megahertz ranges. So it can do this slow process to read one by one by one by one by one into your computer, into the device, and process all these things and make your character jump or whatever. And it has made the cost of the device much smaller. There's fewer wires in here. You're only using a couple pins on the microcontroller, so other pins can be doing other things. And you don't need a 10,000 pin microcontroller if there even were such a thing. So that's why you'd use serial in and serial out. It's used in similar ways for things like a calculator. You might have a microcontroller with just a couple output pins, and then those output pins go into a shift register, and the shift register is connected to a seven segment display decoder. And that decodes and puts up a three on your screen. And then the shift register could be connected to other shift registers, one for each digit perhaps, and the first shift register pushes into all the other shift registers, or you have just a conga line of them or whatever. So your microcontroller, an expensive thing, relatively speaking, is only going to be having to use a couple pins. And then you have these cheap little shift registers, which is just a, a little CMOS thing. You could even get more than one on a chip. You can pack them in, can connect, and those can have all the pins you want because they're just traces on the PCB which are over here not taking up space over here. So there's your basic principles of serial and parallel in and out for registers in a computing device. So you can go ahead and crack all your innuendos about what this little drawing actually looks like. I will be seeing you.